Hey everybody, just me again, Wayne. Here it is, the third and final part of my group bodybuilding chat with, alphabetically, Doug Brignoli, Steve Green, and John Taylor, a trio of guys who have a wealth of bodybuilding and competition experience and wisdom, and among them a list of titles about as long as my forearm. My first contest that I have entered, part of my bucket list, gonna cross it off, it's coming up October 30th, I reached out to all three of these gentlemen and asked if they would be willing to spend an hour or so giving advice and perspective and so forth, and they all agreed to do so. And it's a miracle I was able to get three other guys besides me to participate in the discussion at the same time. In fact, uh, one of those three was only able to join at the very last minute. And there's a fourth fella to whom I have reached out who has a lot of uh, bodybuilding and powerlifting experience and success, and I'm going to interview him separately and post that as a separate video. You'll know it when you see it. So here it is, the third part of my bodybuilding group discussion with Doug, Steve, and John. I hope you like it. The majority of things that I've seen online about preparing for a contest state that one should choose a contest that is uh, 12 weeks or more away. Assuming that by the time you're thinking about doing it, you're in reasonably good shape already, you're going to need at least that amount of time for, uh, you know, for additional bulking and then dieting. And I don't mean dieting as you know, the way the term is used popularly in the culture, but I mean, you know, planning what you eat. You know, I'm going to exist by taking in these things. Now, that having been said, what suggestions would, would you all have about you know, adjustments to one's diet other than, you know, obviously no more ho-hos, right? Or those trigger foods that if one, you know, has a bite, you know, I'm just going to have one handful of cereal. Next thing you know, the whole box is gone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, 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 uh, what suggestions uh, or, or just comments or advice or observations do you guys have about, about dieting and prep for a show? Well, I'm sorry. The first thing I would say is 12 weeks is obviously an average because it depends on your starting point. Right. If you've got a lot of weight to lose, you'll need more. <laughs> if you don't have a lot of weight to lose, you might need less. I mean, I've actually, you know, I, I competed one time eight weeks after starting my diet and I was plenty lean enough to take first <laughs> place. Um, in fact, I, you, you could even argue that I wasn't much leaner four weeks later. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's not quite, you know, a mathematical thing. But what I want to say is um, what I've learned when I was doing the contest back in the 80s, um, I thought that the whole trick to dieting was eating zero fat. So I would eat, you know, basically protein foods and carbohydrate foods. And back then there was that book called Eat to Win by Robert Haas. And he would talk about complex carbohydrates versus mm -hmm. simple carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. Those terms aren't even used anymore because they're meaningless. But the book suggested that a complex carbohydrate is starch, where it takes longer to break down. And so it's better for dieting than a simple carbohydrate like fruit. But now we know that carbs have a glycemic index and a glycemic load, and it's irrelevant to whether it's a polysaccharide or a monosaccharide or a disaccharide. So what I was doing was really not smart, meaning I was eating potatoes and rice and fish and chicken um, and, you know, zero. I mean, I was afraid to take vitamin E. I was so avoiding fat. I was eating the lowest fat fish I could. Um, but the problem with that is that as long as you're eating starches, you're spiking your insulin. And so when you spike your insulin, your body doesn't want to give up its fat stores. Mm. Okay. It basically closes the door. So on the one hand, you're telling your body, here's a calorie deficit. You need to make up this deficit with the fuel you've got stored in body fat. But I'm not going to let you do that because you just close the door with your, with your, with your rice and your, and your, and your uh, potato consumption. You spiked your insulin. You've made that fat over there mostly unavailable. <clears throat> so you end up feeling like shit. You end up feeling terrible. And, and that's not the way to go. The way to go is to first eliminate that box of cereal you were talking about. Eliminate all starches and sugars. So you're not eating any flour products at all. No uh, potatoes, no rice. You can look at the glycemic index and say nothing over, let's say 40 on that scale from zero to 100. 
which would mean you're eating mostly vegetables for a carbohydrate source, then you should eat some fat. You should eat your fat from, the, from olive oil, avocados, um, maybe coconut oil, or even ghee, or egg yolks, or beef. It's all okay, but it's calories. So the idea that I had that fat was somehow a taboo thing, it certainly is not a taboo thing from a hormonal perspective, the way starches are. Starches are taboo or should be taboo because of the hormonal effect they have. Once you get rid of the starches, then it's just a math game. It's just calorie consumption. It's just um, you creating a caloric deficit. So get rid of all your starches first, keep some fats in in the beginning, then slowly start cutting back on your dietary fats as a way of reducing your caloric intake. If you're hungry, eat more protein because that's always safe, right? And then you'll find yourself getting leaner and leaner and leaner because you have a caloric deficit and there's no insulin spikes to prevent your body from accessing the adipose tissue that's being stored on your body. Now, while that's happening, anytime you have a, a caloric deficit, your body will start to fight back by reducing its metabolic rate, mm. right? So that's why a lot of us balloon up afterwards because we may have slowed down our metabolism to 800 calories a day. Once we start eating 900 or 1,000 calories a day or two or 3,000 calories a day, boom, it all comes, it comes back and then some. So that's just part of the game. You cannot lose body fat unless you create a caloric deficit. Uh, and you have to just understand that along the way, your body will be reducing its testosterone production and reducing its thyroid production in order to make you have a smaller gas consumption motor. Sure. And, and you might, you, you might want to get a blood test along the way and, and find out if your testosterone and your thyroid level have gone below normal, because if, they, right. if they have gone below normal, your doctor can prescribe to you something to get you back into the normal range, which isn't quote unquote taking steroids. It's you. It's just like a diabetic taking insulin. It's just you fixing a problem with your health that is not only going to hurt your health, but it's also going to work against you in, in getting prepared, prepared for your contest. You know, I had not given any thought at all to the idea that maybe some of those, you know, physiological uh, functions and, and signs and such, you know, that, that are that are not visible, uh, you know, would be changed. Yeah. By eating, you know, even um, a healthy diet, but in a having a caloric de uh, deficit. So you know, I, I'm all for quote unquote natural bodybuilding. Um, th but the problem is that natural, truly natural bodybuilding um, has just inherent problems, which is what I just mentioned. That if, if you really do train hundred percent naturally, then, and you dieted enough to, to really get lean, by the time you get to the contest, you are not healthy. That's right. Your body has completely, <clears throat> shifted its hormone system so that now you are just basically the equivalent of a diabetic, not so much from an insulin standpoint as so much as from, you know, a, a protein, a testosterone and a thyroid standpoint, your hormone are imbalanced. So that's why I say, you know, when I competed with the AAU, they do drug testing, they do urine analysis, but they're really just testing to see if you have extra high testosterone or extra high thyroid. I don't even know if they check thyroid, but you know, as long as you're in the normal range, I think you're still considered natural. Okay. Okay. Now the, the event that I've chosen, uh, the organization has everyone um, uh, undergo a polygraph test, um, you know, before the contest. And then the winners all have to, you know, pee in a cup, basically, uh, if, if, if one wins, uh, just in case you manage to somehow fib your way past the, the, the polygraph person. I, I, there's probably a noun for the person that runs the polygraph, but the polyographer, let's say that. Yeah. So okay. well, I don't know if you can rely on those because people get nervous, even when they're telling the truth. Yeah. I've thought about that. And, um, and I'm, I'm actually going to state, uh, I mean, depending upon how nervous I feel that day, you know, I I'm nervous as hell. I've never done this before. I'm 56 and, um, you know, so uh, I hope well, you can take you that into account when you're, when you're reading you know, the graph. Nervous. Even if you're not taking anything, you could be nervous that you're going to get a false positive. And right. Then, and then it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Then you do get a false positive because you were afraid you were going to get a false positive. <laughs> yeah, it's a well, vicious you, circle. 
And, These uh, polygraph know, tests, uh, they account for that. And they know people are nervous when they're taking them. I mean, I don't imagine anybody would take a polygraph for any reason and not be nervous. So they establish a baseline at the beginning uh, and they, they, they get your, however they read it, they, they figure out how nervous you are. And then your responses are measured against the baseline. Uh, so if you go in like ultra nervous. Uh, well, but, but here's another thing is that let's just say that you're taking the polygraph test and they say, have you taken any testosterone? <laughs> and you say, um, no, that's wrong. If you say, yes, that's not, you know, the same thing as taking Dianabol, right? So um, I, I don't know how they, how, they, how they do this thing. I mean, you know, there could also be, there is such a thing as a test that a urine test or a blood test that can see whether the testosterone that's in your system is endogenous or exogenous, produced by your body or coming from an outside source. And if, if you are taking testosterone because, because your testosterone level was 50 um, on the blood test, which is way below the normal healthy level, and your doctor gave you a prescription and brought you up to 400 or 500, which is still well below the 900 upper limit, you're still taking testosterone. So now you, are you gonna lie because you said no? I, I don't know how you get around that. All I'm saying is that my opinion, it's just for whatever that's worth, my opinion is that it's not a good idea for a person who's getting ready for a bodybuilding contest to force themselves into a 50 or 100, you know, reading on a testosterone blood test. They're unhealthy. Um, and if you're unhealthy, you should fix that. And the idea that if I fix that, I violated the contest rules. Uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know how to comment on that. Um, it's, you know, a matter of priorities, right? Yeah. My health versus my vanity, as it were. You know? Well, so. OK. Bodybuilding uh, outside of contest can be very healthy. OK. I believe in bodybuilding for health and longevity. But bodybuilding for a show. I don't care if you if you do it all right and, and follow all the parameters and all the neat stuff right. that Doug was saying. It's still not a healthy state to maintain. I mean, you're you're doing it for a show. You're you're going in there to get your body into this freaky uh, appearance that normal people don't have, and um, it's it's not it's not healthy. You don't want to maintain it. Makes sense. I mean, I would I would say that if you if you don't already know what your basal metabolic rate is, your starting point um, for if you're going to be counting calories, that's um, that's something you'll you'll want to know because if you're under the belief that you need four thousand calories a day and you're going to gradually decrease that, you may not get into the shape that you want to get in. So um, I would I would recommend getting a good understanding of, of what it takes calorie wise just to maintain your your weight at your current level of activity. Very go. good. Very good. Thank you. Do, you. do you know how many calories you typically average in a day? In a day, typically I average between 19 and 2200. So, so you, you went through the trouble of, of looking at the books and saying this has this many calories per this much yes. weight. And I yeah. eat this much weight of this food. I mean, it's, it's a math problem, right? And it gets it, it more complicated is. if you don't eat the same thing every day. Yeah, one, one point I thought about while we were gone is, is the nervousness. <clears throat> if you have practiced your routine for weeks on end, to your music, you hit a certain pose at a certain beat of the music, a crescendo or whatever, and you know it like the back of your hand, then when you go out on stage, I mean, okay, you're not going to be nervous pumping up because a bunch of other guys are back there. But when you're standing there and you're about to go on stage and you can see the announcer and he's talking and he's announcing you, that's when some nerves kind of start. But all you're, you're thinking about your, your uh, routine. So anyway, so you go out there. Once you get out there, my experience where I have the auditoriums, it's dark. You might be able to see the first a few rows, but you don't look at them. I always looked right at the back of the auditorium, pretending like I was in front of a mirror at home. All I saw was black. I saw nothing. And once my music started, I was down in my, my start pose. And then you're on autopilot. 
and you're not even thinking about the audience anymore. I mean, it's like totally gone. You're in the present moment and you're into your routine and you've done it a million times and you know exactly what you're doing. And so you come off as very polished. So there's just that, for me, you, I was always a little bit fidgety uh, while the announcer was talking about me, you know, where I was from and all that kind of stuff. But th then it all, all disappeared. So I just wanted to say that before I forgot. <laughs> you know, um, Steve, I did wanna, Steve touched on a point that we, we didn't talk about, but um, that was pumping, pumping up backstage. And I, I've noticed um, that sometimes people who are new to bodybuilding competitions, they will basically perform an entire workout before they walk out on stage. Yeah. Okay. And uh, you really want to be careful uh, that you don't overdo it. Um, in fact, just some people will argue that you just do very, very little because the, the blood rush will obscure some of the definition. That's true. Yes, yeah, it can vary yes. from person to person, but, but I would just not plan on doing a whole lot. Or just, just practice your posing because that'll pump you up. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up, John. That, that's a question that, that, I, that I wanted to ask about because I see references and I've heard references, right? Like the pump up room or, or whatever. And, and I wonder how much pumping does one do? Um, yeah. So, so thank you for throwing that in there. And by the and, way, you uh, know, yeah, posing is hard, man. Just it is hard. And I was going to say, you things. know, a lot of times people think that that pumping up makes a, a bigger difference than it actually does. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, um, it's a little bit like I always kind of laugh when I see. Sometimes we see a girl spending all this time in the mirror and she's doing these little things, and I want to say, you know, you look the same. After all these little things you think you did to improve your look. You didn't, right? So pumping up is a little bit the same way. You, you noticed a little bit of a, of a difference, a little bit of an improvement, you think, but other people don't notice it because it's that minor. So either you have it that day or you don't have it that day, right? Right. And pumping up is usually done more than adequately enough just by practicing your posing, which you can never get enough of anyway. Well, I, I think that pumping up is, is kind of a mental thing for, for some people. And, yeah. you know, John brought up a good point that it can obscure the, the muscle. Um, okay, so you feel bigger. Let's say you're pumping your delts, your triceps, and your biceps, which is pretty common. Those are the showy muscles. Not much you can really do to pump you. You know, I don't know your back or your big. You don't do squats back there. So you're pumping up these showy muscles. So you're all engorged with blood, and your delts, and your arms, and psychologically, whoa, you know, okay, I, I feel like uh, Godzilla out there, you know. But yes, that can obscure. Uh, it, it might make it harder to pose because if you're all pumped up and you and you hit a shot, I don't know, maybe you'll cramp or something. Well, well you are you are definitely exhausting yourself when you're back there pumping yeah. up. And part of, I mean, we all know what a pump feels like, so we all know we feel bigger. Yeah, yeah. When we're pumped up, but yeah. the question is, do you actually look bigger, significantly right. bigger? And the answer is not as much as no. the difference as how you feel. You feel significantly bigger. It's up here. It's not. Yeah, it's not really a visual thing. <laughs> You can always spot the, the guy who's been pumping up excessively because he'll be shaking a little bit out on stage. I'm sweating. <laughs> That's yeah, true. Do that. That's true. Guys, you have been great, and I have kept you uh, far longer than you uh, had agreed to talk, and I really appreciate it. Do you have, is, do you, have um, you know, like a parting shot, as it were? And something I think that would be a value, Wayne, um, is particularly if we do a, a subsequent uh, talk, is uh, has to do with the diet the day before, the night before your competition. I'm going to defer to the experts here because I'm old, I'm very old school when it comes to that, and we would really carve up, and sometimes that doesn't work so well. So I'm just, I mean, Doug is probably the one who's competed the most recently. Um, that would be something of value for you to to hear about. Yeah, well, I will say briefly that 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 carb loading works best if you're carb depleted, and carb depletion. Um, may not be a good thing, depending on how you look before you start carb depleting. So, um, and then the other thing that I've noticed too is that, and this is very common, is that a lot of bodybuilders look better a day, two, three days after the show. Always. They look the day Always. of the show. Yeah. So, um, and, yeah. and, and, and that's a little bit of a mystery. In part, it's due to the fact that you're more relaxed two or three days later. But it's also because the body does actually need to recover a little bit from the dieting. So even sure. if you're not carb depleting and excessively carb loading, just backing off the diet makes you look better. And you're not gonna start getting fat for at least a week. 
after you start increasing your calories, especially if you're increasing them sensibly. So it's not a bad idea to, you know, to think, to think in your mind that your lowest point of your diet is one week before the show. And for the last week, you gradually start increasing your calories a little bit. And maybe the day before the contest, you bring it down again. So your, your stomach is flat and you're getting all that food out of your system. And you should look mag magnificent on, on that day. In other words, don't, don't do anything extreme. That's the lesson I've learned is these extreme carb depletions, extreme carb loading. They end up making you feel terrible. They might make you bloat. You have your insulin spiking all over the place. You're better off just slowly bringing down your calories until your lowest point is one week before the show. And then one week before, at that point, then you start increasing your calories just a little bit. And you come into the contest feeling healthy and fuller um, without having gained any additional fat in that five, six day period of time. And, okay, and so excellent. It would be water consumption, you know, yeah. before the competition. Well, my, my thinking about water consumption, and people freak out, they take diuretics and they hold back their water and they dehydrate. You know, your, your muscles rely on a certain amount of, of, of blood volume for fullness. So if you start, you know, reducing your, your, your water consumption, dehydrating yourself a little bit, you're going to get cramps, your vascularity is going to go away. You might, you know, lose some muscle size. So what I would say is don't drink more than you're thirsty and make sure that you're not eating excessive sodium. You're taking some potassium supplements so that whatever water is coming in is going into the muscle and not to the skin. But again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't experience thirst, deliberate thirst. Um, and nor would I take anything that's going to make me dump water. Just don't drink more water than you're thirsty for. Well, we are water-based creatures on a cellular level. We need water. That's how the cells operate optimally and so i would suspect that i always felt like i i felt better and i looked better the day after the the show i i think it's because i mean uh, you you might speak to this doug that the the muscles might actually physically become smaller because there's not enough water in the system and water mm. keeps us i don't know <laughs> you know what i'm trying to say maybe you know well, that's the reason why I was saying a week before the show, start gradually increasing your calories. Yeah. So your muscles, your glycogen starts to fill back up again. And the water that you are taking in goes to the glycogen that's being held in, in the muscle. And you'll just feel healthy. You'll feel happier. You'll be in a better mood. You know, it's just the better way to go rather than this drastic starvation, drastic depletion, <clears throat> drastic loading. I mean, it just, it just plays havoc with your body. I okay. was the master of that drastic stuff. <laughs> You know, the last two weeks before the show, I just went on tuna water, an occasional salad with some oil and vinegar. I mean, I was extreme, you know, and I could I could drop it off and get cut uh, pretty quick, you know, that last uh, week to two weeks. But yeah, like you say, Doug, that's that's extremely unhealthy. Yeah. And, and not only extremely unhealthy, it, it may actually detract from your look. Well, guys, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time and your input. And, um, you know, as, as I've done with the talks that I've had uh, previously with Doug and with Steve, I'm going to be watching this over and over again, you know, during the editing process uh, and afterwards, because you've given me a lot, no pun intended, a lot of food for thought. And I, I, I truly appreciate your time. And there you go. That's the third part of my bodybuilding group chat with Doug Brignoli, Steve Green, and John Taylor. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to give it a thumbs up. If you know someone else who might enjoy it, feel free to share. And by all means, hit that subscribe button if you feel the urge to do so. Thank you very much for watching. Come back again soon. You guys are awesome. Talk to you later.